If I could fill up all the chasms in your heart Then I could bury it in the basement of your parents' house Yo, 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 what's going on? And welcome to the Part-Time Artist Podcast. This is episode 182. Damn, I should have put a Blink song on in the beginning, but whatever. Shout out to Blink. Um... Before we get into this show here, I want to let you guys know that War Park has announced our tour. That's right. Uh, my band War Park is hitting the road. Uh, be sure to follow War Park Music on all the social stuff. It would be great to see some podcast people. I already had some podcast guests reach out to me that they'll be stopping by when we hit the road which is probably the coolest thing in the fucking world um but aside from that what's coming up is camp punksylvania i have a link in the podcast description to get your tickets to camp punksylvania and we can hang out we can camp we can tell stories play songs you know all that good stuff camp punksylvania is probably the best music festival ever um so uh yeah click the link get tickets super cheap um there's also going to be a link down there for distro kid and visible distro or yeah visible distro kid is how you can get your music on all the streaming services that's what i use so if you click that code you'll get seven percent off and what was the other one? Oh yeah visible visible code if you want a cheap uh cell phone network it's it's verizon's network and you can download it's it's an electronic sim card you can go through the whole process get a new phone number whatever in like 10 minutes so if you are looking for a new cell phone provider and you don't want to pay more than 20 25 bucks a month you should do what i do and jump on visible the whole reason i have these uh, links is because I actually use these things. So, yeah. Um, but the best way to support me, honestly, if you want to support the podcast, is to subscribe on YouTube. Leave a comment, leave a review on the podcast platform if you're a listener. But really, YouTube is my main passion. I love making videos and I love putting things out there that is going to inspire and empower other artists so please 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 interact with this video on youtube give it a thumbs up give it a comment and subscribe to the channel all right i have with me a very very special guest hailing from the land that is new york city i have mike from nihiloceros now if you don't know nihiloceros and you've never seen Mike before. First of all, he's been on the podcast before. You can go back in the archive. But also, if you've ever asked me for advice or asked me about the New York music scene, chances are I've I've pointed you in the direction of this guy right here. Because you, Mike, have just been one of those dudes that, to me has risen above everything, man, because New York, and I was just in New York this past weekend playing a gig at the Bushwick Public House, and I was thinking, I was like, man, I, and and I spotted a full-time aesthetic sticker, so shout out to full-time aesthetic. I was like, man, this is like, in the past 10 years, this is like one of the few places that's like still here. And when I was living yeah. in New York... I think every place that I played in like the 10 year span I was gigging is gone. Um, A lot of them are. Yeah. It's, it's gone. So that can be really discouraging in, in that scene. So the fact that you've been there and you're, you know, pulling through no matter what, what do you attribute like that, kind of investment like do you just kind of feel like no matter what i'm down with new york this is where i'm at i just love it here no matter what's going on in the music scene i'm just here for it <laughs> yeah i mean i i mean i was like that in chicago too it just you know i i it's, they're very different cities but it would operate the same no matter where i'm living so if right. i moved if i moved to vermont i think i'm going to do the same thing right. um 
but I think, I mean, it definitely took some getting used to after moving here. The, like the, the constant shuttering of music venues. Yeah. I mean, it happens, every, but it happens here in a way that I experienced. So I think there's like, you, you just gotta, I learned early on, you, you have to get used to just, yeah, I just, the, there, there are venues that have come and gone before I even had the chance to, to yeah. play. And you're like, ah, oh, like, like, I don't know. Like, like, I don't know. There, there's just so many. I was, I was going to start listing off yeah, venues yeah, that yeah. like came and went. That could, that could be a whole podcast. Yeah, exactly. Now, before we get into the show here, I want to ask you, like, it's summertime now. And um, I wanted to ask you, dude, like, and and I saw this like somewhere on the internet, like there were some musicians like asking like, hey, it's like summertime now, it's like slow season for a lot of people. Like if you're a musician, what kind of job do you have or whatever? So I wanted to ask you if you've ever had a summer job, what was your favorite summer job and what kind of summer job do you think would be good for a musician or an artist? favorite summer job i always had like shitty summer jobs nice. like they were like i mean I, I was like i was like a cater waiter and i did construction and i did landscaping and it was all like stuff that like you know was good for like cash like like you, you didn't have to pay taxes your money was yours it was yours immediately <laughs> that sort of thing um but they were all like highly like labor intensive and hard and you know it was never like i had friends that were like lifeguards and stuff and like that <laughs> I mean, or like worked at like an ice cream shop. The, that's, uh, I mean, that would be, that's the dream. Yeah. To have like a summer, it just screams like summer, like high school summer. Yeah, for me, it's always going to be summer camp. I'm going to just say that summer camp, yeah. working a summer camp is the best thing in the world. But I actually just started as a cater waiter. And, and I know exactly what you're saying because... No matter what you get paid with some of these jobs, it feels like you're still getting ripped off somehow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It could be because it can be like, especially those jobs where you're on your feet the entire time. Now, yeah. let's get into Dark Ice Balloons a little bit. This is your new album, and I got a little bit of a heads up on this because um, I, I wrote, for those that don't know, I'll put a link in the description, but I... I posted a review for Punk News for the single, which is Skipper. Um, so yep. you guys can check that out. I just wrote a few words about the single and how I was eager to hear the rest of the and album. Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, you did put a gun to my head, so I didn't have much of a choice. <laughs> <laughs> yep. But um, I guess something I did want to ask you in relation to that is... Why did you choose Skipper of all the tunes? You have what seven or eight, I guess. What what, what was it about Skipper that stood out to you? Yeah, eight songs. We decided we weren't sure when we were putting out how many singles we wanted to do. We were like, we ended up with doing four, and I think that's kind of was what I wanted to do. But we tossed around three or four. But the it was kind of really tough to. This was like yeah, probably harder choices for like single rollout that i've done in recent years um because we we had a lot of different opinions and i sent it to when the record was like when we, we got the masters back i i i was constantly changing either which song i thought was the most powerful which which had the most gravitas as far as like what would grab a listener when they're listening or which one was my favorite um and that just kept changing and i really just couldn't get any sort of like bearings on what i thought would be like it also too we hadn't put anything out in like three years which like isn't like a million years but um wow. i wanted I, I i wanted to make sure that like you know it, it was the first like out of the pandemic like not in like like self Detroit came out in 2021 but we were still like in the middle of things being weird so this is like the first like it was I and mean, it was like you know it's a short lp but it's an lp and you know it, it it came out after the pandemic and i wanted i wanted to be like no we're still a band in real times you know, real normal times and all that stuff. And so I, I was really sort of in my head as to what, what would be that introduction back to us putting out new music would be. Right, um, okay. And I don't know, Skipper just like, it was, the, it was weird, but in like, like it wasn't the most overtly catchy. Mm. 
Um, it wasn't. Um, Good old it, Spectrum, guys. This is what Spectrum does. <laughs> worm. It had the weird, like, bass synthy, you know, part in the chorus. Yeah. Alex and I both sang, which is like something that we've always kind of done, but haven't done. We didn't. We leaned into it a little bit more uh, on this one. So I thought that was. It was just like it. It. It did a lot of stuff that was very much us, but also it did a lot of stuff that wasn't so obviously us in, yeah. in a way that was still us that sort of felt like the best way back to put out something that was familiar but also very different yeah that and if that's that kind of like what i was picking up when i was you know digesting it and and putting the words down for punk news i was like this is so a hundred percent you guys it's a hundred percent nihiloceros but there's something about this that is so different. And then when I listened to the yeah. rest of the album, um, I think the first time I actually did listen to the record, like from start to finish, I think I was driving somewhere and I don't remember where I was, but I actually did come to, like I pulled over, I came to a stop when I finished it. And um, it was the last song on the record where I was just like, oh my God, this is incredible, and I, I I pulled over, and I think I even texted you. I was like, dude, this song, Purgatory, yeah. oh my god, it hit yeah. me right away, and it's so, it's so funny because you and I are going to be sharing the stage in Brooklyn in August at Purgatory, at which Purg is such a crazy synchronicity, and I wanted to kick off the show with that tune, so let's just jump right into it. This tune is called Purgatory. Check it out. If I could fill up all the chasms in your heart Then I could bury it in the basement of your parents' house Everyone loves to love a love song sick or not So I want you to know that I do it all for you
right, that tune was called Purgatory, and that's my favorite tune on the record. And I would love if you could just share some words about that song, where that song come from, how did it come about? Um, because I think Al has like a big role in that song. I think Al yeah. takes over on the verses for most of them, right? Yeah, yeah, it's sort of, so, so Alex is the verses, I'm the pre-chorus, and then we're both singing on the chorus, yeah. but even on the chorus, sort of the backing. Um, and that's, it's funny, because that right, that song almost didn't make it on the record. Oh my god. Um, because we were, like, we never really set out, we, 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 we just, we, we write songs. We, like once we feel like we have a collection of like something that feels like a thing we start thinking about a record and like how we want to present that and like you know is there a, is there a through line like story wise is it just like a random collection of songs blah 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 however we we put out records over the years but when we're just writing songs we're just writing songs but we don't really think oh we're gonna put out we're gonna do these four this is gonna be a six song record or what so that wasn't really ever part of the conversation but w when we were like deciding what we were gonna record and what we were gonna toss um, we, we had seven songs that were ready, like had been like already demoed and we're like, we're going into the studio in a couple of weeks and these are going to be the seven songs. And I think because we put out self destroy as like a long six song EP, we really wanted whatever we put out to be long enough to be able to technically qualify as a short LP. <laughs> so seven. Right. And we're like, well, if you do eight, that's a short LP. It's a, unlike, much like having a long EP, it's a short LP. So having that eighth song at the at the like you know the eleventh hour became kind of important to us. And we didn't have anything like we had already like tossed out all the the garbage stuff and had seven songs that we had like demoed and worked on that like German had like come up with drum parts for that Alex and I had written like you know like lyrics and melodies and like, that were actually songs and. Alex is like, don't you have like one more song in you that we could just like, yeah. and I'm like, I don't have anything else that's like ready to go or ready to work. Like, I'm like, do you have anything else that you've been working on? And we, neither one of us had anything that was like ready enough to be able to throw into a record in like, like a handful of days. And he dug out that song was actually a demo that him and his, or the original of that song, he found a demo in his email that we had been working on 10 years ago together that him and his wife or it was at the time, but Amanda, his girlfriend at the time, they were they were like writing this collection of like summer songs and garage band that they were just like making with each other at home on their computer. And there was a demo of an earlier version of that song that they were that they had recorded together that he had positioned early on when he had joined the band back in those days as a song for us to like turn into a song. And we were granted we, we, we wrote it, and, and I think on, on the demo I had done, like, some guitar and some melody stuff, and then we had worked on it, like, to try to get into, like, like, like the practice space and play it, like, wow. you know, in the rooms back then, but it just never, like, landed anywhere. So we threw it in the trash, oh and it's been sitting in the email for 10 years, and he put out. Like, what if we turn this into a song? So, like, there was no words, there was, there were, or there was words, but they were, like, fake, you know, like, gibberish words, and, um... The parts weren't finished, and there was like a, like a, like a like a garage band drum beat on it, and I was like, "There's no way Gervin's not gonna write drums to this because he has to go and track drums first in like a, like, like a week or so." And it's like it's pretty straight. I was like, "It's pretty straightforward." He, he, Gervin's a great drummer; he'll come up with something. And it's not like it's not like it's not one of those songs like some of the other ones where the the interesting beat is what's driving the song. You just right. you just gotta like write some rock to the song and it'll be good. And I was like, "All right." So Gervin listened to the demo once, Unreal. came up with what tracked it the next day in the studio and that and then we recorded the song to it and i rewrote the the lyrics and whatever but i think we even kept the synth part that's it's the only song on the record that has synth uh -huh. and the synth part of the record i believe is either it's either the original synth from the garage band file or we I, we might have like uploaded the midi into like ableton or whatever it was you were we were using to replace okay. it with with yeah with notes. but it is actually the synth midi demo from 10 years ago so it almost didn't make it on and we actually just like it was an 11th hour like, add-on to make an eighth song unbelievable wow it it does have like it there there is something about it that stands a little bit it feels like it stands on its own versus the other the other tunes and i think maybe that's why yeah. it just caught me by surprise at the end because like in my head it was the type of song where i was like oh 
like there's like this is hitting a climax in the story like the record is going to go in a different direction now or whatever and i was and then the record was over i was like oh wow like wait a minute shit that was the grand finale or whatever like it was such a like i went on such a roller coaster like just after and even i was listening to the record also like on shuffle to give it like a different context and like yeah. there were, where where purgatory was showing up was creating such a different you know um architecture for like the landscape of it from song to song now one thing i do want to ask about the architecture of this record first of all dark ice balloons what the fuck does that even mean what is a dark ice balloon where did you come up with that well so like the <laughs> the record Whole is sort of at least the way sort of like yeah. it's like either like a continuation or a response to where we left off with self de- self destroy was like all about and again r- most of the lyrics written pre pandemic but all about just like the absurdity of existing and mm-hmm. you know just like the whole uh, like what is existence and what makes us human and like what's the point and if you pull back far enough you know it's all meaningless anyway blah 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 and that was like a really like petty dark place for me to take myself when i when i was writing for that it was like it was literally saying like what is the point of me writing the words that i'm writing right now for this record why are we why are we as a band even putting out this record and making these sounds because and one day none of us are going to exist and it's all going to it's all just going to it even if 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 first of all we're rapidly destroying our planet we're uh mm. as a as a species we're going to evolve into to something else at some point this planet won't even be around or if it even is the creatures here will have evolved into something they can't even see or understand or you know it's all yeah. this all this legacy all this all this everything that, that that we do and everything we put out to be remembered and understood and expressed you know, all of those things are completely meaningless. And I wrote that not really tongue in cheek, but I like I wrote that seriously as like one way that I'm was viewing the world. And but then after like spending months with that, it sort of felt like I, I took on kind of like when an actor plays a character for too long and you can't really shake it. Like that sort of be, became a part where I'm like, uh, like and it was really like sort of dark. Luckily, I went to Egypt right after the record came out and experienced the beginning of humanity right after writing about how like ridiculous the idea of being human is um, yeah. and seeing seeing the like like swimming in the, in the Nile and touching the pyramids and seeing the beginning of civilization was like a total mind fuck after like having lived in this world for, for so long. So oh, wow. when we approached writing again. I was like, I feel like there's more to say on um, the way that I, that, you know, we left it as a band wasn't the way that I wanted to like continue the story. So I was like, even though I'm not like a person, if I consider myself, you know, extremely spiritual and, and what that means changes, I think from time to time, but I wanted to explore death and existence in a way that was a little less, a little more hopeful, which is still a record about dying and about a little like less not, not- nihilistic for nihilosaurus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, so a lot of the records, it basically presumes different scenarios of what like an afterlife would would, would be. Mm. So it's not, it's not, it's not religious in any capacity in any sort of like Judeo, you know, Christian or, you know, Eastern Western religious, like anything. It's really just from a spiritual standpoint. And it, it toys with some of those ideas that are like inherently religious, like the ideas of heavens and hells and, you know, Dante's sure. Inferno. And the and the rapture and all that stuff. So those 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 little like Easter eggs are all buried in there, but they're all just like it's really just like what if instead of blinking into nothingness at the end of all of this, which is what we presumed on the last record, what if this happened? Or what if you know you came back as this? Or what if reality continued on in some sort of parallel way like this? Mm. And so that was the approach that the record took lyrically. Um and Dark Ice Balloons is the first line in Penguin Wings, yeah. which is the track. And really that song, I think, as the opening track, sets the tone for a lot of like the worlds that the record lives in because it, it like a Dark Ice Balloon is like a frozen hot air balloon. And, and a hot air balloon that's made of ice can't fly. Penguin <laughs> can't fly. Like Penguin Wings, digital oh organs. God. 
So it, it really early on is supposed to set the tone that like the physical world that we all know, the world of science and reality is not the world of this like supernatural beyond that in, in whatever fashion these different songs are taking you into these different worlds. Right. Um, you're supposed to know right off the bat that you're not living in our physical realm. Yeah, the way I did pick up on that, because when, when you do say... So first of all, there's a few things that I really love about your music and I love about your band. One of them is the fact that you have a lead bass player. I feel confident in saying that. I love that you have a lead bassist. But the, um, We made a point to have zero... Act, there's not a proper guitar solo anywhere on the record. Yeah. And so that really leaned into like the lead bass parts because there's no, no real guitar solos on this record. Shout out to all the bass players. This album's for you. Um, but aside from that as well, the lyrics and the words, like, you're not you're not giving it to us on easy mode. Like you're giving it to us in a way where it's like you're gonna need to like you're gonna need to cut your food. You know, you can't just pick it up and put it in your mouth and be yeah. done. Like you need to take your time with this record to digest it. And yeah. Penguin Wings, when you bring all that stuff up, it was like thinking about the other perspective of things because penguins are birds that can't fly. So do they have wings or do they have flippers? But then you think right. about when they dive underwater, when we're swimming, it kind of looks like we're flying. And if there are fish underneath us looking at us on the surface, they might think that we're flying in a way. It's right? all about... Well, it's all about perspective. It's all about the perspective. So that's why I was like, damn, there's there's definitely something here with this album title that that begs that begs the and question. That, and that's great because as a lyricist, I've always like whenever people are like, What's that song about? Like it's not and it's never that it's not about anything, but I, I, I even even in the abstract, like I write I write lyrically and always have about specific instances that I'm feeling. So they, it might be an actual, like there might be a very real moment in my history that this is like about this person or about this thing that mm. I'm writing about. But, but, but I always have strived and hopefully I succeed some of the, the time to write it in a way where it, it it's more like the, 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 the emotion or the feeling behind w what I felt in that moment or in that experience can i relate that into a way where then you as a listener can take that on and ascribe that to something that you're going through that you're experiencing so that your perspective colors the what the song's mm. about so like the, the song i've never wanted the song to be about if i if i wanted to write a song about like i i dated this girl and she broke my heart and then I would, I would just, but I want to take an experience like that and write it in a way that when you listen to it, it could be about your mom or it could be right. about you know, something you're going through with, with, with a friend or something mm -hmm. like, like, you know what I mean? Something can be different. I once wrote a song about breaking up with my sobriety that everyone thought was a breakup song, but it was really about my relationship with, with, with my, my addiction. And I've always wanted to it to be about speaking of the perspective is i want your perspective to be what this because you're what, how you feel and what you hear is what the song is because what the who the fuck cares what i have to say it's what what are you mm. hearing wow yeah yeah like it almost feels like kind of when i listen to your music i i think of it as if i was walking into a museum and kind of looking at the artwork and yeah. that's the most like that's what I appreciate the most aside from the bass solos. The bass solos are cool too. But let's They're jump really into great. another tune here. This is another this is uh this is a tune that also features Amanda. This tune is called Martian Wisconsin. Check it out. <laughs> Like fireflies, won't talk, Madam or Mister. Snapshots of silver. This Martian Wisconsin, Earth wrapped in cover. This Martian 
All right, that tune was called Martian, Wisconsin, and you can get everything on nihilosaurus.bandcamp.com. We have cassettes. We have vinyls. And speaking of which, you owe me a cassette, by the way, just saying. Um, I did. <laughs> Cause I did buy I did buy the the album for I don't know I think I bought it for like twenty five bucks or something in the beginning. Yeah, when yeah. I, first... <laughs> I don't. They were around our band camp, so you can have whatever format you would like it in. All right, I would like a cassette and a hot sauce, please. Now, um, cool. <laughs> um, I mentioned before that Mike and I are going to be playing together on the same bill at Purgatory in Brooklyn. Um, this summer in August, it, it is our tour kickoff show for War Park. We have not toured since before the pandemic. So, and this is actually our second attempt at touring. Our first tour, the whole thing fell through. So, this go around is going to be like a pretty religious spiritual experience for us because we did like you're you had mentioned to me before that you're a believer in momentum and when we were going into the pandemic it felt like we had all the momentum in the world yeah. and um and it really had us questioning whether or not we were even going to continue like i left new york i was like i can't be here anymore this yeah. is this is done for me and you and I also are not really natively from New York, so I wanted to ask you, because you're so much stronger and more more of a warrior than I am to be able to stick through in New York through the pandemic and came out on the other side. What is it about New York? Let's, let's do like a, a, a past, present, future thing. What drew you to New York to begin with? What keeps you there now, and what do you foresee with New York in terms of the music scene and you personally? Um, what drew me to New York in the first place? Uh, I'm from Chicago. My wife is from Chicago, and we both. She was doing. She was more acting at the time, and I was obviously playing music. Both of us love Chicago, and New York and Chicago are similar in you know in the grand scheme of things but i think we both had outgrown chicago and just mm. went not like it was bro we're, we're, we're done with chicago but it was more like we wanted something bigger we wanted something more um when i had toured through new york as a chicago band i always loved playing here um sarah loved new york i think we both just every time every time we would visit we would never get enough we'd be like we gotta just gotta keep going back to do more things what, well, why don't we just move there? And the bass player in my band at the time um, had the idea of moving to New York. He never made it, so he's still actually in Chicago. Um, but but all of those things together sort of like pushed us to go. Right. And I, I moved, moved ahead of the band and started booking shows. And they were flying out to like play shows while we were figuring it out. So I sort of just like spearheaded migrating music from Chicago to New York. And it turned out completely in a way that I didn't expect um because i'm playing with different people and it did end up being a different project and everything but that's how i got here and why i got here mm. um what was the second question is what keeps me here um yeah, what keeps you here now it's the i mean it's, it's it's the friends and the people and the scene and the energy i mean it's all of it. it's all the reasons why new york is awful and awesome is all wrapped up in one big <laughs> tangled of of noise and energy um and for for now it 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 suits me well um and and the people there's so many just like amazing people i've met here who not i i either interact with or i'm lucky enough to be married to or being in a band with and i mean the i mean also too the not to say i'm any stronger than you as far as sticking in new york during the pandemic i was lucky enough not only do i have a wife to lean against when things get tough who's amazing and super supportive of everything i do but right before the pandemic was uh, i we moved sarah and i moved into bought a house or our basis bought a house which is where i am right now um mm -hmm. and we rent stairs so had being two-thirds of the band being together with like one of my best friends and bandmate and another one of my best friends who's his wife and my wife all living in the same house yeah. um definitely you know that's that's kind of a support system that that's the you dream, know is just right like yeah 
for real. I, I we and literally it was November of 2019 we moved here, which is the whole idea because I was in Sunset Park for seven years, which was like my commute to shows and practice and all this. Like I was like grinding because I would spend like five hours a day on the subway because I was nowhere near where all oh my stuff God, happened. Dude. November of 2019, we moved here with the hopes that, like, this is just going to make my life so much easier because now I'm going to be, like, I'm in Redwood, right where, right where I practice, right where we play. I don't have to spend five hours a day on the subway. And right after that happened, like, a, a few months later, the entire world shuts down. Yeah. I'm like, I just got it. So I, but, but that's, like, I, that sucked at the time, but I could not, and Sarah and I talk about this sometimes, I could not imagine having had, had to have lived the pandemic that far south in Brooklyn alone without the connection to, like, friends and bandmates and community. Not to mention, if I were, like, single and living down, like, like there's just so much that I'm lucky to have been able to, like, have here that, that kept me sane mm. and grounded and and okay. Yeah, it's all about it's all about that community. And speaking of which, let's give let's give some people some free game here. Yeah. From you. If they want to play in New York, let's give three spots that you recommend playing and maybe three other bands besides your band. Three other bands maybe you recommend playing with. Ooh. That's so hard. Um, three spots that are great to play right now. Um, Purgatory, where we're playing in August, is definitely one of my favorite spots. Uh, you know, Queer Run, DIY venue that's, you know, a great space for the community. Um, Main Drag is back, um, which you recently played. I recently played, really, yeah. but I lightning last time I saw you in New York a few weeks ago. If maybe that was longer ago, no, not that long ago, was at Main Drag. Um, yeah. So yeah. the old Main Drag has reopened in a new space as the new Main Drag, and is putting on cool shows. So I really do love that spot. And you know what? I got I got to throw it to Our Wicked Lady. I mean, the, the list can go on and on and on, but Our Wicked Lady will remain the home of so many of us here. Yeah, they. W- have their mission and their ethos and everything that they opened for in the first place and what they remain to do and, and the people that own it have continued to be supportive of the community and were like a safe haven and a North Star throughout the pandemic and worked harder than anyone to, to pivot through all the weird regulations and the rules and the changes and the laws to keep a place for people to go to safely be able to like see music in the different forms that they were allowed to at the time. Yeah. Like our Lady during the pandemic was like, I mean that they 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 saved a lot of people. Like it was yeah. so. Our we- is- yeah, yeah. Those are those are definitely three great spots, and all three in Brooklyn. So definitely head out there to Brooklyn. What about what about three friends you can just think of off the top of your head? No, in no order whatsoever because i know we could we could go on and on and i'm sure once i hit once i stop recording you're gonna think of like 20 more people that you could have named but like three off the top of your head flash point off the top of my head debbie dopamine um probably one of the best underrated not that they're not you know heralded for what they are but that band should be like ginormous and they're not and they should be Uh, (laughs) they're on their way but debbie dopamine yeah and, and I mean, seriously, Katie is one of the most prolific songwriters and talented people I've ever met. Um, and Zach and Dylan are, are amazing. Um, so, yeah, definitely. Um, Debbie Dopamine. Alithios, who should label with us. Um, that whole crew is doing some of the most, like, beautiful, innovative, romantic music um, around. And um, I don't know. Uh, Free to Kill. Free to kill. Free to kill. Always. Yeah. Always. I mean, they they crush it every time. And they're just like, they're just so good at what they do. Yeah. 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 Um, and and from from the outside, it looked like Punk Island went well. It looked like the scene is still is still there in New I York. Know, <laughs> I was hanging out with, with, with Nick at Punk Island. We talked, you know, work hard thing that 
tour and booking and music and music being fun and music being hard and family and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Punk Island is just one of those things that that's hard for me to miss, but it's it's one of the sacrifices that I make in order to you know, kind of have my roots more in the ground here in Philly, which I love. But I will be back. I'm going to probably apply next year. We'll see how it goes. And we're going to be in New York with you to kick off August. Stoked for that. Stoked for your new album out. Everybody head over to nylosterist.bandcamp.com and you can click their link tree, which has the most links I've ever seen in a link tree. There's plenty to do. The issue is that we started getting all this press for the record, and like I'm just like, well, I gotta put in the link oh, tree. Oh, you poor but thing. I, I, I need. No, 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 no. But what, what, what I mean is it doesn't all need to be there, or at least yeah. I don't know how to them, like, organize it. Um, so I just put it, and it just, it, it's like Alex describes it as, like, you know, grandma's attic or whatever, where you just keep putting stuff up there. And he's right. So, like, you oh know, my God. I, I, I'm a bit of a hoarder. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a, hoard, a link tree hoarder. All right, well, this, let's... We're going to send it off. This last tune is the second tune on the new record. It is called Killing Ghost. Rip on, everybody. (laughs) 